Hi, um, I'm Leslie Masibi. Um, I'm a virtual sales um, specialist for collaboration. I've been with Cisco for three years now. What does pride mean to me? It means inclusion, equality, and celebration. Being a member of a family, being given equal opportunities, and celebrating individualism. When I joined uh, Cisco a few years ago, coming from Johannesburg, um, I had the opportunity to meet different people from all over the world, and those people allowed me to be who I am. I felt in an environment where I could openly talk about my sexuality, tell them stories about uh, my boyfriend without fear of rejection or even humiliation. I'm in a company and I'm surrounded by people where I know I'm given equal opportunities, not based on um, uh, my race or anything like that. And people celebrate me and I get to celebrate others every single day. And this is what true pride means to me, being in an environment where you feel truly feel like a member of, uh, of the family. Good morning, good afternoon. Um, I'd like to thank Leslie for sharing his perspective on Pride at Cisco. Uh, that video was produced as part of the EMEA Better Together Week, um, and I really couldn't think of a better way for us to kick off this morning. So I'm Chad Reese. Um, I'm part of the global digital marketing team here at Cisco. Um, I'm also the global co-lead for the Pride ERO, and I want to extend a warm welcome um, to all of our Pride members and LGBT allies joining today all over the world. So today's event is a truly global one. Um, so in addition um, to our audience here in studio in San Jose, um, we also have uh, local chapters attending via telepresence um, from two of our largest campuses, so both RTP uh, in North Carolina as well as Bedfont Lakes um, in the UK. Uh, and then in addition to those of you who are joining us via Cisco TV today, um, we're also hosting Pride local viewing parties um, through Cisco TV in places like Atlanta, Tokyo, Bangalore, Berlin, London City, Mexico City, Vancouver, Stockholm, and also up north in San Francisco with our friends at AppDynamics. So in addition to that, this is the second time that we've chosen to stream the Cisco Pride Global virtual event externally. So we're also live on YouTube and Facebook, and I'd like to extend an extra special welcome to our customers, partners, um, and LGBT network friends who may be joining today. So let's check in with uh, some of the Pride local chapters who are, are joining us today. So RTP, are you out there? Bob, Jennifer? We're here. Hello. Welcome. How's Pride season treating you? Doing great. Yeah, we have Looks a great like event it. going on here today. Yep. Awesome. And then uh, do we have Bedfont Lakes with us? Mark and team, are you out there? Hi. Hi. We're here from Bedfont. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> so, uh, I love so it's, your it's good to have you. Uh, so it's Pride season, um, and you know this is the time that we come together as an LGBT community, together with our allies, to celebrate our community and also a lot of our accomplishments. And last weekend was the San Francisco Pride celebration, and I'm proud to report that Cisco had a record showing. Um, it was also a special occasion uh, for me and my family. Um, this was the third time that my son, Quinn, who is, was able to march um, with the Cisco contingent in the San Francisco Pride Parade. Um, and I think we can see that as time has gone on, Quinn has got progressively more interested in the parade. Uh, and I can only hope that uh, next year he chooses to walk the one and a half miles on his own rather than being carried. But we wanted to share some of the special moments that were created last uh, weekend with you. So if we could roll the Pride montage video, that would be great.
Awesome. So I'd like to sincerely thank Nanda Guru Swami, uh, Will Stark, um, Kristen Rivers, uh, Lisa Sullivan, and others, some of who are in studio today. There was a lot of work that went into making that a special occasion for all the employees and the, their families who participated that day. So Pride season, you know, it's also an important time for us to come together and continue the progress that we've made towards LGBT inclusion, collaboration, and equality. And I think we'd be, we'd be missing something um, if we didn't acknowledge that in the current climate, um, both in the US and I think in many other places around the world, many of in our community are feeling more at risk, uh, more uncertain, um, and that we're really in the danger of taking steps backward in the hard progress that's been won under the, uh, over the last number of years. And that's why we chose authentic leadership um, as the topic for today's event, because we need authentic leaders now more than ever. Um, it's also why the Cisco INC communities um, and the people deal are so important. So we're certainly not perfect, but Cisco is definitely a place that stands for LGBT inclusion and collaboration. And that shows up in a couple of ways. It shows up in our consistent 100% score on the HRC's Corporate Equality Index, um, as well as our ambassador rating for Workplace Pride's most LGBT-friendly organizations that's coming out of EMEA. It also shows up in the consistent public stand that Cisco continues to make on topics like marriage equality, transgender rights, and workplace equality. I think a good recent example includes Cisco signing the United Nations Standard Conduct for Business, um, which really tackles discrimination against LGBT and intersex people in the workplace. And that brings us to the topic of today's event. So authentic leadership requires a couple of things. It requires that we bring our whole selves to our role, even when we're faced with disagreement or misunderstanding. But in addition to that, it also means creating a space where others are encouraged to contribute and do the same. So today we'll explore what it means to be an authentic leader, um, how this is related to bringing your whole self to your role and to work, and how we face uh, the obstacles that sometimes are in our way and keep us from being the most authentic leaders we're able to be. So we've got a number of special guests today. We're excited to have our keynote speaker, Angelica Ross, here in the studio, um, an, an established LGBT community leader, successful entrepreneur, actress, and model. Ms. Angelica Ross has established herself as a leading figure of success and strength in the movement for trans and racial equality. So we'll hear from Angelica, and then we'll convene a panel made up of senior Cisco leaders, um, as well as allies, and we'll have an open discussion on what authentic leadership means here at Cisco. So what does that mean in the Cisco context? So a couple of quick housekeeping items. Um, those of you who are joining via Cisco TV, you can join in the conversation through our moderated Q&A. We've got some folks on there from the ERO that can help answer your questions. We'll probably also take a few of those in the studio today. Um, you can share today's event on social media through the hashtags WeAreCisco and Cisco Pride. So now I'm thrilled to introduce Angelica. So from the boardroom to film sets to the White House, Ms. Angelica Ross is a leading figure of success and strength in the movement for trans and racial equality. For more than 10 years, Ms. Ross has directly engaged her communities to create opportunities for independence, freedom, and success through social work, entrepreneur and leadership development, business building, and education. Most notably, as the founder of Trans Tech Social Enterprises, which empowers trans and gender nonconforming people through on-the-job training and leadership and workplace skills. Drawing from her own experience, she delivers powerful insight to help all individuals discover and appreciate their own value and understand the importance of acceptance. Please join me in welcoming Miss Angelica Ross. Hello, everyone. This is Angelica Ross. And I am so proud to be an openly black transgender woman. My guest tonight is an actor and the founder of TransTech Social Enterprises. Please welcome Angelica Ross. I don't give a shit what you think. 
But when you or any of you do anything to put the lives of trans women at risk, I will fight you. And make no mistake, all I do is win. How hard it is to be diplomatic in an environment that basically discredits your your worth of even being there as a woman in the first place. There's a lot of space where we're just kind of forced out of school, we're forced out of the work. No place really is safe, and especially in certain states for trans people. 55% of us have been fired from jobs. 16% of us have dropped out of school due to harassment or violence. And at least 41% of us have tried to commit suicide. So first we wanted to create a safe space that people could come in and access the internet and computers and trainings and build their skills for better employment. You're basically teaching them that trans employees are the same as every other employee. They just spend their day on Facebook looking at cat videos. Well, <laughs> actually, trans employees are actually even better. You know, but ser seriously, because they work that much harder sometimes because we know the playing field in front of us. And so sometimes we're even working two, three, four times as hard just so someone will give us an opportunity. Society has told us we have no value. Man is able to take me to a restaurant, but he's not able to bring me home to mom yet. Society's still not at a place yet where they see us as family, as see us as respectable. You really seem like a pretty decent guy, so I just want to put something on the table before we commit to a whole evening. I am a quick eater. You're cute. And you are beautiful. What I would say as a piece of advice is just to find support. You cannot make it through this without support. And if it's not your family, make a family. Because I'm getting emails from girls from Africa who are telling me, hey, um, I'm, I'm really struggling here. Life is really hard for trans women, but there's not much I can do from there. But what I can do is connect via the internet and online communities to connect to the communities across the globe. All need these windows and doors of opportunity. Now, me personally, I prefer those sliding glass doors that open all the way up. So I have a lot of room to explore and to, and to see things. Is It's not about just letting people in, but it's also what you're putting out. What Trans Tech is here to do is to reflect to our communities a, a totally different message. That they do have value, their stories have value, their lives have value, but sometimes we have to help them discover exactly what that value is. How, how do you begin educating people and saying, hey, I understand that as a society we're also transitioning. How do we begin that conversation? Um, Google. <laughs> it's fascinating. You can find any kind of information on Google. I know what it's like to be on the margins. I've experienced it firsthand. The barriers that trans people and women of color in our society face. And it is my mission to help those people who have been knocked down get right back up. Thank you so much for having me and inviting me to Cisco Systems. I'm so glad to be here to talk about authentic leadership. I think I didn't even know ahead of time that that was going to be your theme, but I was like, you got the right girl for that. So <laughs> um, again, those of you who are watching via satellite, definitely join in on the conversation online, tweet, do all that you can do. I always start, like to start when I do these presentations um, with this quote from Maya Angelou. We delight in the beauty of a butterfly, but rarely admit the changes it has gone through to achieve that beauty. Um, and I use that quote a lot because uh, as a trans identified person, we relate a lot with butterflies um, and just going through that transition. And when I think about that, I think about scientists and if scientists could crack open the cocoon mid-transition to kind of like sort of get what's going on underneath there. Um, I'm sure there would be a lot of key information that you would want to know, like what's happening in that transition process. Similarly, you know, it is through having relationships with trans people that you actually get a look on the inside of what it looks like to become that butterfly, to transition. A lot of times people don't know what that looks like because they don't know anyone trans. And they might not know anyone trans because maybe their family and the people around them have hidden those people out of sight. 
because uh, as you will see a lot, like on the show that I'm on now, Pose on FX, um, a lot of LGBTQ people, especially LGBTQ people of color, are rejected from their homes and pushed out into the streets and forced to sort of fend for themselves. Um, but this process, I have to say for me, um, I used to always ask myself like, why, why, why did this happen to me? Like, why couldn't I have been born differently? Why couldn't I have been born a cis female and just had that straight and narrow? Or why couldn't I just been born a cis male and just have my mind be that way and just not be trans? And luckily for me, through my Buddhist practice, I was uh, offered an answer that was just so profound. And the answer, why, is really, and you'll, you'll hear the answer through my story here, is really in the proof of every step that I have taken in my life, of every challenge that I've been faced with and have overcome. I know that I was meant here to overcome those challenges, not only to improve my own life, but overcoming those challenges has rippled out across the world. As you see a little bit in the intro video, like I've traveled this world to inspire and connect communities to opportunities. So um, I always like to start with giving a little context before I could jump into the content a little bit and just saying like, why am I here? And obviously I'm here because we are in a certain place in time right now. And I believe I'm not just here, you know, I'm happy that we're celebrating Pride Month. And I have to say that typically um, Pride over the past several years has had like these wonderful large parades, but as the parade marches by, trans people are being violated in the alleys and in the back streets. Trans people are being murdered and, and, and our community hasn't really taken a full um, look at this and how that we can stop and help these things and help our trans brothers and sisters. Um, so not only do we need to have more awareness around trans issues, but also issues of people of color. Um, our LGBT community has, um, you know, our history sometimes is gets whitewashed. And that's why I love, again, shows that Ryan Murphy created, like Pose, that gets to show where trans people of color were in this telling of the story. Because a lot of the times you see them and we're really not in the stories that they tell. Also, when it comes to leadership, we need to develop the type of leaders. We need the type of leaders who can stand in front of everyone and account for everyone. Too often we have leaders who are not able to speak to the dynamics and the intersections of our LGBTQ community. We, uh, issues like reproductive rights are rights for not only uh, lesbian and, and uh, women, but also trans women. You know, uh, when it comes to immigrant rights, we have LGBT folks that are fleeing from countries. They're seeking asylum um, because the things are so dangerous where they are. So immigration is our issue too. Black Lives Matter is our issue too. All of these issues are issues. And so I'm here because I can help and I can speak to all of those issues, but I also want to encourage and that we develop more leadership that can speak to those issues regardless of what your personal identities are. So I wanna start and tell this story, the parable of the medicinal herbs. And no, California, not those medicinal herbs, <laughs> but um, in the Lotus Sutra, which was one of the last sutras that the, the Buddha sort of expounded. Um, there's this chapter, the parable of the medicinal herbs, and I love this chapter because this chapter is one of the big things that helped me to discover my value. And it's a story about a rainforest or like a, you know, a jungle with all this type of wildlife. You've got redwood trees and orchids and ferns and, you know, just everything. And it explains that they're all being nurtured by the same rain. When it rains down, it rains evenly so that everything is nurtured to its capacity. And it also explains that the sun as well, it's the same sun, we're living under the same sun and everyone is able to be shined upon again to their capacity. 
And in this environment and in nature, they find ways to coexist, to support one another. When it comes to our human society, unfortunately, through practices that I think also have come from like capitalism and things like that, we get into unhealthy behaviors of value comparison which is what you do when you compare Coke and Sprite or whatever, you know, two different products. But when you are trying to compare yourself to someone else, that is a very unhealthy thing to do. And the reason why is because, you know, we have these stories where like the redwood tree and the orchid, there is no comparing the two. They both bring what they bring to the environment. As well, you know, when I like to sometimes compare redwood trees to um, white cis men. And I like to say that, you know, in, in nature, redwood trees, they take up a lot of space. They drink up a lot of water, right? But in, in that environment, no one is, sort. there's not a fight because not only do they drink a lot of water and take up a lot of space, but they also create homes for other animals. They create shade and bring oxygen to the planet. There's a lot that they naturally give because that's their capacity to give. So when I think about like folks who have this great capacity in, in our society, we have to learn that just as much as we take up space, how do you create space? that how do you create space and not only that when we look at the orchids and we look at the ferns how do we look at them without thinking that they're insignificant how do we recognize the value that each and everything brings and how do we make sure that each and every body is fed to their capacity this is something um for me uh, through my journey of in which I'm going into my story of sort of discovering my value in a place being brought up in a church in the middle of America in Racine, Wisconsin, where there was no context for my value. There was no explanation. At least the book that we were reading, I was an abomination. But I knew very well in my soul and in my heart that just wasn't the case. Like, I could play piano by ear from the fourth grade. I could, I was the compassion I felt overwhelming, like flowing from my heart. I knew, I always felt like the spiritual thing. And when I was young, I always had this feeling that I was going to be some sort of um, spiritual teacher. I always felt that, but I thought it was going to be in the church. Um, and so when I sort of finally left the church because I couldn't make sense of things, I went on this long journey of sort of um, trying to figure it out. And still carrying this feeling that I'm supposed to be, and I'm like, how am I having this vision of be, being there, but I'm actually right here. And that is also one of those things that through my own journey, I learned that we have to learn not to count people out too soon. I almost committed suicide because, and sorry, mom, um, my mom hates when I say this, but I say this for context. My mom asked me to, cre to commit suicide. She basically said, listen, I can't deal with this. Uh, my, the God I serve and the Bible that I study says that this is not right. So either you kill yourself or I'm going to kill myself because I can't deal with this. And so I attempted suicide that night. And I just remember, luckily, that, you know, that I survived that suicide attempt. But in hindsight, I look at, and again, when I answer that question, why, why did you make me this way? Why, why, why? In our Buddhist practice, we believe that I chose this. Before I even entered into this world, I chose it. And I'm thinking, well, wait a minute, why would I choose something like this? You know, why would I choose to be ridiculed? Why would I choose these things? It's because of my ability. As a Buddhist, as a Bodhisattva, we on purpose enter the world in order to help relieve suffering and to uh, highlight um, possibility and peace and all these things in a very specific way. And what's, what is to be shared for everyone is that everyone sort of has the same mission. 
no matter what you're born with or where you're born, your mission is to prove through the proof of your steps and of your life that life goes on for someone like me. That not only that life goes on, but I have access to just as much abundance and peace and power and love as anyone else. And sometimes you have to go through a, a process of understanding. Because once you have an understanding that can't be shaken, I, and, and I have an understanding of my value. I know that 10 years later, how many late years later, me and my mother are like best friends. I can't keep her out my closet. Like she's constantly working out, trying to fit into my things, but you know, <laughs> but, but you know, so my mom's like, why do you keep telling people that I said that, that I hate that you keep saying that? I said, mom, you're a Christian. You're evangelist. You believe that you have a mission, and you do. But sometimes what happens is we get into these very dogmatic places, and we don't understand that the mission is right here where we are. It's right in front of you every day. It's an applied process. And so my mom, as we mend our relationship and come together, I want her to be able to talk just as freely as I can talk to you about this event that happened in both of our lives that changed both of us forever. Because my mom, who had those same sort of things to say that you hear from some people in America that are anti-LGBTQ, that think that we're nothing but rapists and that we're gonna go into a bathroom and uh, harm someone, but once you realize that my child is, is a part of this community, and I know that my child would never. She's at a place now where I told her, I said, Mom, you have to help other mothers realize, how did you get from point A to point B? Because everyone else is struggling right now. How, so be open. Be vulnerable enough to say I made a mistake, a mistake that would have, I would have regretted. And, and, and that is for her, for me, every year after that, every year after 16, I see as a blessing and as proof that I was supposed to go on. And after that, I still struggled and still tried to find my identity. I tried to change. I joined the military um, when I was 17 years old and had my parents sign like a waiver so that I can get in early. And I turned 18 in boot camp, um, but found myself in a very misogynistic, toxic, toxic masculinity environment, um, homophobic. It was, it was terrible. And this was in 98, 99. And uh, I luckily got out, but not before receiving a lot of threats and one that ended up in them hanging me by my ankles out of a third story window to try to get me to admit that I was gay. And I, you know, I tell you, just thinking about our country, again, there was a certain message that set in my heart as I completed boot camp, as I completed those things. And the, I'm watching the red, white, and blue flag wave, and everyone's crying because we've gone through this whole night of just testing ourselves and what we will go through to defend this country. And I was crying for completely different reasons because I knew that I was fighting for rights that would not include me. And so eventually I knew that my fight would have to be outside of this. And I, I, I got discharged from the military and began on this long journey of discovering my value. And as a trans person, because of being kicked out from the house, because of being fired from multiple jobs, I found myself being pushed into the adult industry. And I learned something about sex trafficking. Didn't know a lot of things about sex trafficking, but one of the things I learned about sex trafficking that helped me heal, heal the shame and heal certain things, was that sex trafficking involves a high level of coercion or any of that people tracking. What else are you gonna do painting the odds and showing the odds and back in 90 something, 
It was like, you're right. What job am I going to go to and not get fired? I just got fired again. Um, what job is going to give me the health benefits to be able to move forward in my life? Um, there were so many uh, obstacles that it made it seem like this was my only choice. And what was wonderful for me about this is that, again, knowing that I was on a spiritual path, being put into the circumstances, I did not allow those circumstances to define who I was. So in that circumstance of being in the adult industry and this exchange, this transactional thing, I have to tell someone what I'm worth. And as I receive that, I have to think, mm, okay, I need this right now. Let me store this away, blah, blah, blah. And I'm doing what I have to do because no one else is helping me. But as things get better, as things move on, I start to say, you know what? I want more. I'm worth more. And it's not through a shame, but it's through that I actually was able to give myself the grace to grow without judgment and say, at each step, I want more. And there was this woman that was running this adult website. And before I even got like sort of moved into that, she was like, you seem kind of sharp like with the computer, can you help me like rotate these pictures and crop them and put them on the website and then each month uh, make freshen up the home page and make it look like, you know, we just updated and all these things. And before you knew it, I was a webmaster for this adult website and realized I, I could do something different. And from that point, I ended up finding lynda.com and teaching myself HTML and CSS I found freelance websites and started undercutting everyone and said, hey, I'll build your website for $200. It's going to take me a little bit longer, but I'm going to do it for $200, and you're going to get everything that you ask for. And I built a portfolio over 10 years of doing freelance work, graphic design, web building, photography, photo retouching. I photographed models. I did uh, design backstage passes for Ludacris, Cedric the Entertainer. And then I brought that blueprint to my community by launching Trans Tech and feeling like no matter what, you can find a way to navigate this nonsense. If you're willing to focus on a skill and your leadership and build that and allow yourself the grace to grow through this learning process, then you too, if you're willing to be accountable and willing to challenge yourself, you too can reach and achieve anything. This. Uh, you know, but I had to sort of break free from a lot of the community who were giving us lip service and talking about helping us, but they weren't actually helping us. I left a job that was paying me $37,500 for, uh, to help the trans community. And when I left that job to start trans tech, I did not have a job lined up. I didn't have anything else lined up, but it was a message I was communicating to myself and to my community. And I wanted to say, I'm worth more than this. And I'm gonna show you, even though you don't think I am because I don't have the bachelor's degree or I don't have the LCSW, I'm gonna show you how much I'm worth. I make way more than $37,500, I have to tell you, but for a long time, I sacrificed my own salary. I didn't take a salary at all launching Trans Tech because I knew I had a wealth and a value that would eventually overflow so much that it would take care of me and my community. And that is why, that is why I needed to continue to never give up. Because if I had given up, I'm sure someone hopefully would have come up in, a, a, you know, and in, in, in other people, there's so many people doing the work, but the very specific people and lives that I've touched might not have been touched. So I, I always talk about this 10,000 hours and just saying I was able to, Malcolm Gladwell from Outliers talks about genius in the 10,000 hours. Well, a lot of trans people and LGBTQ people of color don't get a chance to put in that 10,000 hours. I was just fortunate enough to steal away that time and, and, and work on tech and, and, and all those things for 10 years 
which equaled my 10,000 hours. So my resume, you know, I've worked, I've gone to Florida Atlantic University. Um, again, I went to college, dropped out at my junior year because I couldn't afford to stay in. But funny thing is, I speak at almost every college around the country, and they pay me very well to do that. So um, I, I have started companies. I've worked at Mac for several years. I've waited tables for six years. I have sold credit card processors door to door. Half the jobs I've done are not even on LinkedIn and on here. But I've done all of this work, and that's why I speak the way that I speak. That's why I present my, because I've had time to practice. We need to create our, our leadership, folks who are in these leadership positions, we need to create space for the rest of our community to put in that time and put in that work safely. Because not all environments are safe. We need to practice a radical inclusion. That means sometimes figuring things out that go against the way things were normally done. Finding ways to extend your spaces that you have with Cisco systems with offices across the country, and we'll talk soon, how we can get connect with trans tech and connect to communities across the globe to give them an access point, a pipeline into a process of developing. We have to be committed to that. And we have to be, uh, be accountable to that because a lot of times in our community, especially during Pride Month, we say a lot of the things that we're doing, but where's, where's the proof? Where's the concrete? Are we willing to let folks like myself hold you accountable, both, both with love and all those things. I'm not the girl that's going to burn this whole building down. No, that's not me. I'm like, how can we work both on the inside and the outside and work together? And part of that, again, process too, I talk about fearless feedback, which I, I, I learned at working at Apple. Um, but again, in authentic leadership, you have to be willing to not be afraid and have the courage to say what needs to be said because that's how you're going to protect the environment for everyone. And so sometimes that fearless feedback, a quick three steps to do that fearless feedback is one, asking the person, hey, is this a good time to talk? Because sometimes when you want to give someone some feedback, it might not be the right time. So, okay, great, it's a good time. Second step is sort of recounting what you just saw without judgment, just recounting it. I saw that you were, you know, at the front of the store when that customer came in, you kind of said some things, uh, she didn't hear you out of earshot, but said some things that were sort of anti-trans. Um, what was that all about? And give, just give them a chance to sort of explain the situation, whatever it is. And then after they do that, give the feedback. Obviously, that's, there's no excuse for it in any sense, but at least let them be able to explain or talk as far as like what they saw and then be willing to address that head on and give that fear. That is how we create an environment because too often the political climate we're in right now is because a lot of people are not willing to give fearless feedback. A lot of people won't say what needs to be said. And then when we do, some people think we're being out of order because we're pushing up back against a system that is already out of order, that's been out of order, and we need to get it back into order. <laughs> so that's it for my uh, sort of presentation here, just to give you a little bit about my life. I know we have a short amount of time. There's so much more that you could, you know, I could say and learn, but you can go to MissRoss.com. Um, you can also go to TransTechSocial.org to learn about the work that we do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Angelica, thank you for telling your story. Um, I think one of the things that really has resonated for me is the way that um, becoming the leader that you are in the community was a process for you. This isn't something that happened overnight. This was, you know, sometimes it feels like bringing your whole self to the game, becoming an authentic leader is like peeling an onion. It almost feels like you never actually get there. Yeah. It's very much a journey. Uh, so that was super powerful for me. I have, I have a question for you. Sure. What would you say to someone who may be in the audience uh, joining us virtually who maybe feels stuck? You know, somebody who, because of their circumstances um, and where they're at, could be where they're at in their workplace, could be their environment, could be the country that they're in. H what, what advice would you give them in terms of taking the next step in order to bring their whole self and, and, and really be authentic? Well. I will say this, um, I've discovered that life is about 
winning little moments, moment to moment. And so a lot of times for a lot of people, especially within this very anxiety ridden state, a lot of times it's just getting over, you know, getting over that moment with ourselves of knowing that I am okay in this moment, being stuck or conf not knowing something is not, is not a bad thing because there's a process that you can take to go ahead and figure that out. So f to start with, you can't be at odds at yourself for being in that stuck place. Understand that we all get stuck. Then next, it's sort of just like understanding as well that as you go on your journey, that my capacity, as I talked about before, actually changes day to day. Some days I'm up here, some days I'm down here. So I need to also account for that. And that so moment by moment when I'm looking to move forward or if I'm looking to go into a certain situation or a certain situation seems challenging, I need to get better day to day at sort of t centering myself. And that's why as a, I center myself every day so that I can come to a situation and I can assess the capacity of that situation, that environment and my capacity at that moment. So knowing that I don't, so that I don't feel frustrated in these circumstances. Like sometimes this dialogue that we have with one another can be frustrating, you know, especially when you feel like you're talking to a brick wall, you're talking to what have you. But if you take more accountability or sort, or sort of more inventory of your capacity in that moment and the capacity of the other person, you become very precise around the engagement. And so a lot of, you know, a lot of this process of learning yourself and learning what am I supposed to be doing is really tapping into and getting quiet and sort of just allowing all of the nonsense to just kind of go away and allow yourself to be able to sit with yourself. Like I can't say enough how you need that balance before walking into something. Even like, even think about it as when you go to work, a lot of people roll out of bed and get ready and go to work and there's no transition time. And when they get off of work, um, you know, they to ride home, but then they might be into something else, into uh, cooking dinner for the family and doing certain things or what have you. At the very least, learning to give yourself some transition time. <sighs> just breathe, you know, for a moment or two, just breathe before walking into something. It'll let you know that I am preparing myself for whatever's next. So you're telling me I shouldn't roll over out of bed and pick my phone up before I even get up <laughs> no. and, check, and check the emails from my boss who's in the room today? No, no, no. You need, you need to, like as a Buddhist, we, our practice is chanting and so we chant and that's our, that's our way of looking ourselves in the mirror. But in the same way, when you get up in the morning, you go to the bathroom and you look yourself in the mirror be, and make sure it's polished so you can see yourself <laughs> clearly and be able to, and sometimes you have to, for, especially for trans people, LGBT people, trans people who may not feel as confident in their appearance going out into the world, you need to still be able to look yourself in the mirror and see the truth of your beauty and see the truth of your everything and be willing to look yourself in the mirror. Sometimes it's hard to look yourself in the mirror, but look yourself in the mirror and say, I like what I see. And if I don't like what I see, I'm willing to do something about that. That's great. Thank you. So, so I think we have time for, if you're willing, Absolutely. we have time for a couple questions. Uh, so if you're on Cisco TV and you haven't submitted a question, um, go ahead and do that. We can take that uh, here in the room. But um, let's start with RTP. Any, any questions from our friends out in RTP for Angelica? No, no questions in the room here. Okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> how, about, how about Bedfont Lakes? Do we have questions in Bedfont? Hi, I've Our got a question. In the UK. <laughs> Go for it. Hello. Hello. Um, uh, my question for you, Angelica, and thank you so much. That was an absolutely moving speech, and it was wonderful to hear it. You are such an incredible woman and an incredible speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my, my question for you is... Um, who has had a tremendous impact on you uh, as a leader and as an authentic person? Um, somebody who may have been a mentor to you, somebody who maybe inspires you, um, doesn't necessarily have to be somebody in the public eye, could be someone close to you. Uh, why and how did that person impact you? So the number one obvious one is Oprah. <laughs> Oprah, 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 Oprah. Yeah, I love Oprah. Oprah 
basically mothered me through the TV. When my mother was absent, you know, we were having our struggling times, Oprah was there. And even though she wasn't speaking specifically a lot of the times to LGBTQ experiences, the heart of what she was saying usually landed with me. So uh, she's been a, a huge mentor, but my, my main mentor, my huge mentor is um, really the three, there's th these three founding presidents of my Buddhist organization of uh, the Soka Gakkai. And when they founded it back in uh, World War II times or you know around the time when Japan was in the war and all these things, um, they really wanted to create a society and focus on a society of value creation. And so when I sort of go back and watch these videos of the history of this organization, I feel like almost like next in line. I feel like a successor in the sense of when I created Trans Tech. I was just creating Trans Tech and going through these things and doing what I was doing. But now looking into the history of my sort of religious practice and organization, I, it's, I feel even more profound about being going through the steps because I'm helping people discover their value and recognizing that society is out of bounds because we're, la we're not able to see the value in everyone because they don't have this or that, the degree or a certain body type or a certain look. And so my, my mentors do this, they do a lot of writing, they do a lot of one-on-one, -on -one. we have this relationship of mentor and disciple sort of situation which is, 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 is a responsibility and it's difficult because we have to be, I'm committed to helping people see through and have an understanding. Whether they practice our practice or not, my practice is to be able to dr drop a seed, at least a seed for someone to understand and they've helped me to do that. Um, so I, they're my number one, that's what drives everything that I do. But Oprah and many other black women that are, you know, fearlessly leading us forward, um, they every day inspire me too. Thank you, that was a wonderful answer. Thank you, I love Oprah. I do too. <laughs> Great, thank, thank you for the question. Uh, I think we have time for one more. Awesome. Uh, any questions online, Nanda? Yeah, we have a couple, but um, I'll pick this one from Abby Burns. So she said, you're so confident in your identity. What advice do you have for any people out there struggling with imposter syndrome, specifically at work, feeling like a fraud, like we've been masquerading as some kind of expert in our field, getting recognition we don't feel we deserve, et cetera? What I say to sort of the imposter syndrome is, at least for myself, how I fight that, is continually creating um, an environment where I know that I am keeping myself abreast of all the new things, the new techniques, the new technology, the new lingo. Like I never wanna be the last one informed about something new that's going on in my industry. So a lot of, half, I know that people's schedules are a little um, you know, tricky and things like that, but you have to find um, time to go back to your lab almost and that lab of creativity and creation that is even outside of the formal structures of your technique, but that place where we get to be artists. And the thing that we do or the skill that we have, even if we lend it to like um, nonprofit organizations, a lot of times as well with imposter syndrome, help finding ways to uh, sort of volunteer and use your skills with nonprofits that need your those skills it puts you into a place of teaching and learning and a lot of times we know as teachers we learn more than the students half the time but again putting you into this space of not only teaching but knowing I need to continue to teach myself you keep that in uh, I think if you keep that energy up it's harder to feel that imposter syndrome because what that what a lot of the times that has to do with is a focus on yourself and not a focus on what needs to be done or, or what have you. So even similarly, when I go to speak or if I were to go to sing somewhere and I'm feeling all this nervousness, I've learned that to get rid of that nervousness is to focus on making sure the audience that I, I have gets what they want rather than focusing on is my hair right? Is this outfit fitting right? You know, rather than focusing on me, focusing on what is the objective, focusing on the team, on what you have to do. My father um, has this saying that he trademarked, which is be responsible to your position. 
So as long as you're willing to take responsibility to whatever your position is and take that seriously, I think the imposter syndrome tends to, to go away. I, I, I will believe anyway. I hope that helps someone. Thank you. That's great. Thanks for the question. And thank you, Angelica. That, that was incredibly powerful. Thank I just you. want to thank you for sharing your story with the, the Cisco community. Absolutely. Thank Thanks you, so Cisco. Much. Really appreciate it. So now we're going to convene our, our panel. So if I can invite Silma and our panelists up to the stage here. So what we're going to do now is have a, uh, a, a conversation about what authentic leadership means in the context of Cisco. Thank you, Chad, and thank you, Ms. Ross. What an inspiring story and what a true authentic leader. Um, for our next segment, we're honored to have a few of our own senior Cisco leaders, both in studio and virtually, uh, to further explore this notion of authentic leadership in terms of what does it mean to be an authentic leader, what are some of the challenges that authentic leaders may face, um, how can we overcome them, and we'll also talk about the important role that a leader can play in uh, creating space for others to be their authentic selves. So we'll start with a few introductions. Um, I'll ask you just to share a little bit about your career path, current role at Cisco, um, and any personal things that you'd like to share, and then what authentic leadership means to you. So welcome Casey Wu and Joseph Futhisero here in room. Oh, you want me to start? Sure. So I'm Casey Wu. I have been with Cisco for over 24 years, 24 and a half to be exact, and uh, have done multiple roles in Cisco, and from manufacturing, supply chain, logistic, customer service, IT, and so kind of have a very diverse view and interact with a, a lot of diverse group of people and are very committed to Cisco's inclusion and collaboration. And what authentic leadership means to me is, as a leader, you have to lead from the heart. Leading from the heart is really the key. Be genuine. And then the other thing is we have to be very introspective and think through our interaction. Um, we have to be aware, not just ourselves, but aware of the team interaction. Because as you mentioned, if you're aware of the interaction of teams, you will create an environment that can open doors for people, that can welcome people, and can be really, truly an inclusive leader. Thank you, Casey. I'm Joseph Pudiceri. I um, lead the uh, digital marketing organization here at Cisco. Uh, I've been here a long time. Uh, it'll be 20 years in July, so it's, a, it's, been, a, it's been a fun ride. You know, um, I've uh, lived in many places. I grew up in Australia, um, in Asia. I lived in Singapore for a while and uh, been in the US for the last 10 years, and it's been a, a fantastic ride. Uh, I have uh, really enjoyed the diversity of, uh, of teams that I've worked with. And as I think about authentic leadership, and I promise uh, Casey and I didn't uh, compare notes, <laughs> uh, you know, I do think about this idea of keeping heart and mind in balance, uh, this notion of really thinking about the person, uh, but also thinking about the role that they're playing within the organization and how to get that right. And a lot of you know, what, what's required in that is to think about where people fit best and how they operate with other people in the environment and how they act as a system, right? act as a, as a community, as a little society uh, to achieve our vision. So for me, that's a big part of authenticity is to think about where people can be their best and how to use your heart to think yeah. about that and where they can do their job and use your mind to think about that. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you, Joseph. Next, we'll go to Brian Palma, who's joining us via telepresence from Washington, D.C. Hi, how are you? Uh, Brian Palma. I am the Senior Vice President of Customer Experience here in the Americas, and I'm the junior person on the panel. I've only been at Cisco about five years. So <laughs> I, started out, <laughs> I started out running uh, Cisco Security Services, and then for the last three years, I ran our advanced services team. And then recently, with our, our change with Maria Martinez coming in, I'm going to be running our customer experience for the Americas. I'm currently acting uh, in Amir, but hopefully soon we'll be naming a full-time leader there. Uh, so excited about the customer experience role and, and very excited to be here. I, I think, you know, authentic leadership for me, um, and I really, you know, what Angelica said really uh, spoke to me. It's, it's really a process, and it's definitely not a linear process. And I think as I've evolved as a leader over my career, I think there's been moments when I've when I've been very authentic 
And I think there's been moments when I've been less authentic. And I, and I don't mean for a day, I mean for, for longer periods of time. So one thing I think that's important is try to, as a leader, trying to create that space, right? Because my authenticity looks very different than your authenticity. And you've got to create the maximum amount of space for people to be able to get into that space and then and then be their genuine self. And as you get to larger, larger organizations, that's, that's hard. It's hard to do. And, mm-hmm. you know, I hopefully have learned and gotten better, but I still think I have the opportunity to get even better than I, than I am today. Thank you, Brian. And thank you all for being here, for getting the conversation started around what it means to be an authentic leader. And I think we're all aware that being authentic is not always easy. It can be challenging. It can require work and courage. And so um, the next thing I'd like to invite you to answer is whether you've been in a situation where it was challenging to be authentic. Um, and what did you, how did you handle that? What did you do to overcome? Maybe start here in the room. Yeah, so uh, this is a funny story, and I was recalling it <laughs> some time ago. But, um, you know, I, I started my career in Australia, and... Uh, I, I was in a sales environment, you know, and it's an environment that is um, a pretty macho environment of six foot tall Irish um, descended boys. Uh, and uh, I, I got to a stage in my career where my manager at the time said to me, he said, you know, JP, you're too short to be able to be successful at anything. You know, it wasn't like I was playing basketball or, you know, <laughs> trying to get on a football team. I was in a sales environment and I was too short for, you know, what I was supposed to be doing. Uh, and it drove me crazy. You know, I, I went home to my girlfriend at the time, now my wife, and said, you know, I, there's a lot I can do. There's one thing I can't do is get taller in this job. <laughs> you know, it's one of those dumb things. Uh, but I realized that it was his problem. He had a struggle and he had a stereotype in his head about successful leaders and what they look like. And I didn't meet that stereotype. And despite his feedback, um, you know, I, I went on to be enjoying my job and being successful at what I do and, and traveled around the world. And years later, I met him again and he was looking for a job. And I just <laughs> felt the, re- the resistance to say something about that, that, that background. But this notion that stereotypes get in the way of uh, people having an open mind and what you can do and what you can achieve is one of the things that I really take to this day and I think a lot about stereotypes and why stereotypes get in the way of being open. So, you know, to me, being authentic is taking some of that stereotype and in a speaker way and, and really thinking very openly about what somebody can achieve. Great. Yeah, some great thoughts there on on uh, unconscious biases and Absolutely. stereotypes and both in ourselves and, and with respect to others. Um, let's continue to explore that a bit, what it means to be our true selves. Um, what are your thoughts on the relationship between authentic leadership and what it means to bring your whole self to work? Well, for, for me, authentic leadership and bringing your whole self is not the same, but they're loosely coupled. They, they mean slightly different things. And for to bring your whole self, I think there's a cultural environment. There is, um, it, it would shape what it means to bring your whole self. And I'll, I'll, it being, not being able to bring your whole self doesn't mean that you're not authentic. You can still be authentic, but you might kind of hold back a little bit. Uh, I'll use myself as an example. I was born and raised in Hong Kong. And growing up in the Asia culture, Chinese culture is about respect the elderly, uh, respect uh, people who is in more senior position. So when I start working in the US, I normally wait for permission to share my thoughts. So am I not being authentic? No, I'm truly authentic. But when you ask me, I'll tell you what I, I mean, what I want, and all those things. But if you don't ask me, I'll be a little bit quiet in the room. And then until when I come to Cisco, early in Cisco, one of the leaders in Cisco actually called me in the room like, Casey, I know you have a lot of good idea, but why do you have to wait for me to ask you? Every time, why can't you just share? So to me, that is a wow moment for me, like, oh, I can really bring my whole self in. Not, not that I'm not authentic, but I was gauging when I can and when I cannot. Ever since that wow moment, I'll just kind of bring my whole self. So I think as a leader, being able to recognize that and being able to open the door for people 
means a lot to people to bring the whole self. Absolutely. I think we can all relate to this notion of how our environments shape us and yeah. how we bring different parts of ourselves to the table at different times. Um, and thinking about environments, what are some of the practical ways that we can create um, safe spaces or create an environment where we truly welcome our employees and colleagues to be ourselves? Yeah, so I'll, I'm, I'm happy to jump in on that one from out here in Washington, D.C. Um, so, you know, that, I mentioned earlier kind of learning as we, we go along the way. And, and I really, for me as a leader, I think there's what I would call macro moments and there's, there's more micro moments. And I think your authenticity has to really span that spectrum. Um, and, and one way, you know, one of the things I've got uh, someone who works for me who runs my INC programs and on a quarterly basis, we have an INC topic at every one of my all hands. Uh, it's something I'm passionate about. It's something that I wanted my teams to know that there's always space for. And um, actually, one of our, our topics was, you know, my IC um, coordinator, Carla Wright Jukes, who's, who's wonderful, by the way. Um, you know, her and I were talking about, well, what are the different topics that, that we could work on? And, and obviously, one of them was uh, LGBT issues. Uh, and we had the opportunity to have uh, Michelle Brune come and speak to my team, uh, which was really just a, a great experience and talk about what it meant for him to be authentic at work and what some of those struggles were. Um, and, and it was a learning experience for me and for my team. But what I realized afterwards was all of the uh, people that reached out for me that I had opened up a channel to and that I now was able to have a dialogue with as a leader uh, on a more personal level. Um, and, and, you know, again, back to kind of the risky part of that, I, I did get some feedback from some folks that wasn't positive about that topic. And I, of course, listened to that and uh, carried on with what, you know, I believe was the right way to go. But there, there always is some risk, I think, as JP talked about a little bit. So my point is, you've got to be authentic. You've got to be able to do it in those one on ones. And you also have to be able to do it in a broader group. And, and the way you do that is variable and um, has to be genuine. But I think you've got to think about as a leader, how do you impact people uh, in different ways? So just a, just a little practical piece of how we've handled it. You know, one other just point is it's, it's not always about the big event. So we had the opportunity last year to send uh, some folks from our team to lesbians who tack. And we were only able to send a few, a few folks, three folks. Uh, but it was an incredibly important experience for them. And then that brought back to our organization energy. And this year, we're going to be able to send a few more. So I, I would never hesitate to start those micro moments that matter because they're very important. Thank you, Brian. And I've heard firsthand from people in your group and how much they appreciate um, those experiences and, and the spaces that you create. And just worth noting, I think, here that you know, once you create that safe space in one area, it can create a ripple effect. We feel welcome and true to ourselves over here, and we're able to bring that to other situations as well. Anyone else on the panel who'd like to chime in on this notion of creating a safe space or what we can do in practice? Well, I, I using uh, JPO example about stereotype. When I first, when I graduate from grad school and get a job from a company that's doing uh, manufacturing on scientific product, so I went and asked my advisor, professor advisor, should I take this job? Is it a good job? And stereotype, he said, manufacturing is not for women. Mm. You should find a consulting job in the financial industry. <laughs> OK, I just graduated with an MS in industrial engineering. Why would I go into a financial <laughs> industry? <laughs> but the, the company that hired me, um, true authentic leader, he looked at me, he said, you know why I hire you? Because you have the oddest combination of degree a math degree, a chemistry degree, and an industrial engineering degree. That's exactly what I'm looking for. So he basically knocked out all the stereotype and opened the door, say, you can use your strength, you can use your knowledge, that's what I want. And that's when I flourish and shine. I jump right into the job. So being able to have people who tells you you can really open door, it allow you to be your, bring your true self. And just like the example I say when, when, when the boss say, why don't you speak up? It just, bam, open the door. And, and I did the same thing. Um, I used to have someone who worked in Japan for a long time. 
he's French, so being stereotypical, uh, he's very quiet. And I said, Frenchmen are usually very outspoken. How come you're so quiet? And then he went through the whole explanation in Japan, the culture is again very hierarchical. He wait for his turn to talk, he wait for permission. I finally say, now you move to San Jose, you talk. And then it changed his world. So I, I just kind of reverse my learning and apply it to other people. Great, and it sounds like also you were able to use your edge and what was unique or yes. odd about you yeah. <laughs> to your advantage. So yeah. glad to hear that. <laughs> JP, did you want to chime in? Yeah, you know, I have a story about Chad about uh, four years ago. We had this conversation. Oh. So he's, he's, he's waiting for this story right now. He's gone on. Oh, no, I think we're all we waiting for yeah, this story. Yeah, yeah. I got lots of stories on Chad, so I, I, I got a whole cupboard full of them. Um, but, you know, we had this conversation four years ago when uh, Chad talked about the uh, the opportunity to, to lead the ERO, and um, he asked me whether it was appropriate. And I, I said, um, apart from the fact that you already don't have time, you know, you, <laughs> <laughs> and but I know you, you'll work it and you'll you'll make it work, and and you'll be very very successful at it. And then he asked me whether it was a risk to do so, and I said, why would it be a risk? You know, we had this conversation about why would this be a risk in any way, shape, or form, and. To be honest, I think Chad felt very uncomfortable to be that public with, uh, with doing um, what he's doing. And I think you can see today that he's very, very good at what he does. He does it beautifully. Uh, and he's recognized by people all over the world for his leadership, not just at work, but for what he's doing for, for society and the community. So, you know, my hat's off to you for taking that step, Chad, but, uh, but that's that's what I think he's hoping for, for everybody in this community, is to be able to take that step, take the small step, take the big step, but make, make, the, uh, make the effort. So uh, it's a story I, I will, you know, I, I have some pride with, uh, in, uh, and I know that uh, it'll be something that uh, it will, be, will be different for a lot of people because of uh, Chad's involvement. So. Thank you, JP. Thank you for sharing a story about someone who's near and dear to all of our hearts and a, a true authentic leader in our community. So That's great. Thank you, Chad. Um, any other good examples of when we were able to make a difference for someone else through being an authentic leader? Either Brian or Casey. Well, I, I think being an authentic leader, you you have to like open door, create an environment. Mm -hmm. But I also want to advise as individual, don't wait for that moment. Don't wait for that, I, I use Angelica's term, be fearless. What can, what can go wrong, right? Just be fearless and jump in. And I, uh, I heard a phrase from someone say, uh, you, you fake it until you become it. So if you're fearless, you convince yourself you can do it, you go do it. You go do it and prove yourself you can do it, and then you naturally become it. That's how you bring your whole self, that's how you become an authentic leader. So as an individual, we should take ownership to be fearless to jump in, and as leader, open the door and create an environment. Yeah, and I think we've learned a lot today about those incremental steps that we mm -hmm. can take. It's moment by moment, and it doesn't happen overnight, right? But this yeah, notion would, of having I mean, to come. I... Sure, go ahead, Brian. Oh, sorry. I would, I would just, you know, offer as well, and Angelica hit on this a little bit, you know, I'm a big believer in mindset and, and breakthrough performance. If you look at anyone who's great in sports and music and fashion and anything you think about, right, it's the mindset, right? There's obviously some natural gifts in, in people who are great, um, whether it's a great voice or whatever it may be. But, but the mindset, as you study the mindset of the people who are great for a long time, it's really a mindset about possibility. Mm -hmm. And I think all too often we naturally think about why things are impossible. Why, why can I, why won't the sales team sell more services? Or, you know, <laughs> there's a lot of things we do naturally that, that put, the, put the onus somewhere else. And I think when we start to say, here's what's possible and here's how I make it possible, you know, it's the notion that your thinking drives your, out, your actions, which drives your outcome. And, th and that's something that I, I think I have subscribed to. It's something we've kind of taken hold in our organization. And I've watched people change their mindset and change their outcomes. So that would just be my thought on yeah. how do you get to that authentic leadership? I'd like to add something. You know, I, I think that we are very, very fortunate in the culture of our company. Cisco, I think, is one of the few places, that's why I've been here so long, is one of the few places on the planet where 
this sort of thing can be talked about openly mm -hmm. and that there's an open mind towards it and in fact we're proactive about getting the voices out and so you know it, it's a it's a safe environment it's an open environment it's an environment where the culture encourages it and my, my, my thought is that there are a lot of places where we couldn't even have this conversation within a company. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And, and I do think that the, the fearlessness and, and I heard this phrase I want to share is everything is possible because the word impossible spelled as I am possible. <laughs> <laughs> like it. Great. Well, thank you all for sharing. And as much as we wish that we had more time with you here today, we're quickly approaching the end of the discussion. Um, we're, we have time for a couple more questions and comments. Um, I know you've already shared some great advice uh, for people out there in the audience. Is there anything else that you would say to someone who is you know, either at the company or outside in the audience um, conflicted about whether to bring a certain part of themselves into the work environment? Let me think. <laughs> <laughs> just, just be fearless, be brave, and put yourself out there. This is the best place. Well, 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 go ahead, Brian. Go ahead. I was going to give you more time to think, Jake. <laughs> Thanks, man. Um, Appreciate it. Um, no, I, I would just say and, and, and the message here is do it incrementally, right? Don't, don't expect, don't expect an unrealistic expectation. Do it in increments, and I think understand that failing. And again, that's the interesting concept of authenticity. Only you really know if you've been authentic or not. So you're the judge of you, and many of us are harder judges on ourselves than we are on anyone else. So be, be patient with yourself when you fail and think about it incrementally. That's great. Thanks for the think time. Um, you know, I think that everybody in some way, shape or form wears a mask to work because you're trying to be something um, that you're not always, um, you know, it's the imposter syndrome or what, whatever it is that uh, we talked about earlier. And I think what you need to do is just to take down the mask a little bit at a time because sometimes taking the mask off could be way, way risky. And to Brian's point, just a little bit at a time, you know, I'm a lot more comfortable taking off my mask these days than I was a decade ago because I'm in a different place in my career, I'm in a different place in my, in my life. Um, and every, every moment matters and the opportunity for you to take a little bit of that mask off is, is, uh, is, is a good thing. Well, thank you. Heartfelt thank you to all of our panelists here today for sharing some critical examples, important insight on how we can create space for people to be themselves at work and create happier, healthier organizations as a result of that. Uh, with that, I think we're ready to hand it back over to Chad and talk some more about what we have upcoming. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you, see you JP. Chad. Thank you, Soma. Uh, and thank you, Brian. Uh, that was really great. Uh, you know, I think. Um, I've had the opportunity to work with a number of those authentic leaders. And for me, it's helpful to hear some of the situations they've been in and the challenges that they've faced to, to get to the point that they're at. So um, today we've heard from authentic leaders from both inside and outside of Cisco. Um, hopefully you found the, the dialogue engaging and inspiring. Um, before I go, uh, I'd like to share a, a few updates just on um, Cisco pride. And so, Talk about an authentic leader. Kim Marcellus um, has served as Pride's global executive sponsor, and she's retiring now from Cisco. So we want to thank and acknowledge Kim for her guidance, for her coaching, for her support over the last year and a half or so. Um, Kim has been a tremendous partner um, for Pride, and we're in such a better position than we were when, when she took that role. So thank you, Kim, uh, and we want to wish you well uh, in what's next for you. Um, we're also actively recruiting a new exec sponsor, so stay posted for that. Uh, some, uh, some additional updates. So Cisco um, is the official host for the Out for Undergrad um, Tech Conference. That's going to be held um, here on the San Jose campus uh, September 7th through 9th. So I want to thank Oscar Cannon for making that a, a reality. Um, you'll see an internal communication come out later this month. Uh, which is going to provide detailed uh, information for our Pride members, our allies, on, on how you can volunteer and get involved with that. Uh, we've also concluded um, the pilot execution of the Proud um, Development Program. 
Um, this was a mentorship program. I'm actually uh, it's excited about this because it was actually this same event last year um, where uh, as a question that came in through the panel, there was a question, why don't we have a mentorship po program specifically focused on um, LGBT, the LGBT community here at Cisco? So uh, Silma, who was our um, moderator of the panel today, she, she made that a reality, so thank you, Silma. Um, and based upon our learnings, we're going to adjust the program um, and we're going to look at how we scale that uh, more broadly across Cisco. Uh, our App Dynamics Pride family um, have, has also been really active this year. So they launched um, an official Pride at AppD logo. Um, and they've also launched their umbrella diversity and inclusion program, which is called Belong at AppD. And also, for those of you who are familiar with Safe Spaces, the Safe Spaces project was something we had active here at Cisco for a while. Um, it's gone a little bit dormant. Um, and so the AppD team has really taken that on. They're going to be piloting the program this year and then work to roll that out um, to the rest of Cisco in FY19. Also, for those of you who are um, in the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, the San Francisco Bay Area chapter team um, is going to be walking in the SF AIDS Walk on July 15th. So I want to invite everybody to come participate in that. Um, and finally, for those of you who are attending GSX this year, we'll be hosting um, our third uh, Pride ERO Mixer. Uh, and this is going to be Tuesday the 21st at 7 o'clock uh, at Libertine Social. Um, that's inside the Mandalay Bay. Um, and uh, Tim Lake, who's, who's been the leader that has made that happen every year, just sent out the invitations for that. It's on the Cisco Pride page. And you'll see um, an invitation also coming out through the Pride-ERO mailer. So a terrific way to, to practice your authentic leadership is by getting involved in the ERO. So there's a number of things you can do. Um, you can connect um, with your local ERO leaders um, or your local colleagues, get involved in, in local activities. Um, you can check out Pride uh, on Jive, the Jive community. I'm sure that's going to be moving. But <laughs> there, there you'll find um, ERO leaders um, at the global, regional, and local level who, who'd love to hear from you. Um, you can join the Pride ERO mailer. So that's pride-ero at cisco.com. That's our primary communication vehicle. So if you're not on there, you're not seeing all the things that are going on at Pride. Um, and you can also join our closed Facebook group uh, by sending a request to uh, pride-ero at cisco.com. So I'd like to thank all of our speakers uh, and attendees today. Um, any questions that were submitted through chat today we didn't have a chance to get to, we'll post those answers on the Pride Jive community. Uh, that brings us to the conclusion of our event today. So have a happy and healthy Pride season. like your idea, we want to make it happen, what do you need? So it is an ultra crazy race that we're taking part in. We're all on the same team here. It's completely inclusive, it's for everyone. This helps to create an emotional connection between that